Yes, as you, you've heard the prompt, this session is being recorded and um, just go ahead and accept that. As Ferdinand gets ready to pray, I see my co-host Sam is here. Um, Sam, would you like to, or let me ask Peter to do that. I, I think Ferdinand is having a challenge um, getting on video. Yes, Peter, are you yes, able? Yes, how are you? Yes, I can hear you, Peter. Hello, Thank hello. You so much. This is Mwakisha. Okay, yes, Mwakisha, you, you are now on. I can hear you, but I cannot see you. You can just go ahead and start us off with a word of prayer. Very well, let's kindly pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning humbly asking that uh, we may carry something of your hope, love, and joy in our hearts. Grant us tenacious wins some courage as we go through this day. When we are tempted to give up, help us to keep going. Grant us a cheerful spirit when things don't go our way. In Jesus' name, we pray and believe. Amen. 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 Wow. Uh, I absolutely love that prayer, Ferdinand. <laughs> it reminds me of, uh, I think it's called the, the, is it the prayer of serenity where it says, um, grant us the grace to, to accept the things we can't change and the, 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 what is that? Does anyone know how it ends? The ability it, to accept the things you cannot change and something. Uh -huh. And, and the and, wisdom to and, know yes, the difference. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry, okay. So let's take it. Sorry, I, I, I only remember. Beyond your control. Yes, yes. So give us the ability to accept the things we can't change and the grace to, to change the things we can change and, and the wisdom to know the difference. So yeah, that's, I, your prayer was quite uh, amazing. It, it reminded me of that. So, so thank you for that. And I think there's no better place, there's no better place to understand that prayer than with the business people and entrepreneurs because all of us have things we can't change and things we can't change and on these sessions we're here to discuss what can we change because we believe we have a lot of energy a lot of power a lot of ability to bring change and to make a difference where we can okay so I'm super excited that we could start with that prayer thank you again for that now um we've done the prayer a bit of housekeeping a bit of housekeeping, please note we are recording this session. So just so you know, you need to give us your consent for that. But also we want to ask as we engage in the chat and also in the Q&A section, I'm going to ask that we kindly be respectful to each other. A little, you know, virtual courtesy is always good. All right. So let's see. So let's see in the chat. Let's see who we have. Okay, let's see who we have. Please let me know in the chat your name. I don't know if you already typed your name and your business. Please put that in the chat right now. I'm going to give you just a few seconds to do that. Okay, you have, I believe all of you have access to the chat and also the Q&A. We will use the Q&A when it comes to the discussion we're going to be having about financials. Okay, but for now, I'd like you to put in the chat, what's your name, what's your business? It's important. We like to use this also as an opportunity for engaging and networking. So it's always good to advertise just put your name and your business. So if someone is looking for someone in that space, at least they know where to start. Okay, I'm just going to give you a few seconds. I see that. Uh, let's see where we are. Let's see where we are. Put that in the chat. We have about 80 people in the room right now. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and put that in the chat. I'm also just double checking. I hope everyone has access to the chat. Yes, Samuel. Samuel Diritu, which, what's the name of your business? So I'd like you to put your name and your business. Yes, Junior Fred. Junior Fred Mbasia in Mombasa. His business is car rental business, Amoy International Airport. That's a good way to know that. If you want to, if you're free to put your contact in there, go ahead and do that. If you're free, only if you're free to put your contact in there, you never know who gets access to your contact and then Next time someone is in Mombasa, close to the airport, they know what to do. They just call uh, Junior Fred and they can uh, get some help there. All right, Frederick Ndungu, thank you. I'm the manager at Ngong Catholic Parish Members Welfare Fund. Very good. Peter Mugo, thank you. 
Wow. Okay, so we have quite a host of people. If you have a website, yes. So this is exactly what we're looking for. So Tender Soko, Julius from Tender Soko, publishing of all available tenders from around Kenya. There's a website. If you have a website, this is a good place to put it in. Junior Fred has put his number there. This is going to be just for like one more minute. And then we'll move towards the next part of the session. But this is a, as important as all the other parts. Okay. <laughs> Junior Fred uh, made a tiny error and is correcting it. He doesn't deal in cat rentals. He doesn't rent out cats. He, rent out, he rents out cars. So if you are looking to rent a cat, you'll have to get someone else, but he's in car rental business. Very good. All right. Keep that coming. Uh, yes, I see that now. That I see that the chat is enabled and all that. Very good. So we have two sections. We have the chat. If you're new to this uh, platform and this uh, event, we have two sections. We have the chat and we also have the Q&A. So chat is where we are putting all our information, everything that you want everyone to know. When it comes to the session and you have a particular question, I will ask you to put it in the Q&A section. We have also a team of people in the background. When our speaker comes up, they will be answering some questions. But also, just when you ask a question, keep looking at the Q&A section. Someone will be responding to your, to your question. And also, when it comes to the Q&A for cooperative bankers, they will be letting us know some an amazing product that they've put together for us. So if you have questions, you put them there. And we also have a team of people that will be helping us with that. All right. Right. Are you excited to get jump, jumping into the session today? Let me ask, let me just walk you through the agenda. So we're going to do a, a quick connect and that's what we've just done, getting to know each other a little bit. We'll have uh, our guest come up. His name is Chris Oliver. He is the CFO of African uh, Management Institute. He has had such great experience with the uh, finances across his life. And I will be telling you a bit about that. And he'll be handling our topic today accounting essentials and strategies for MSMEs. So by the time you're here, I trust that you're uh, one of those, whether micro, small, or medium enterprise. Then we'll hear from our friends at Cooperative Bank, and then we'll have next steps and final questions. So without any further ado, let me let you know whose voices you'll be hearing. My name is Sam Chimera. I am at the bottom left on your screen. I will be the facilitator and moderator for these sessions. And if you've been attending the previous ones, We've been together and it's we are it's going really well. Okay, with me from Cooperative Bank is uh, Peter Ndumea, who is head non financial services. We're going to be hearing from him briefly about why these sessions and what makes it important to provide this non financial services and how does that benefit you as an entrepreneur. The other person that we will be hearing from is our guest Chris Oliver, like I mentioned, Chief Financial Officer, African Management Institute. And uh, Fiona is in the background. She's doing all the groundwork, making sure that these sessions are successful. That's Fiona Maina, Marketing Project Coordinator, and the lead on this particular project. So these are the voices that you'll hear. And right now, I want to invite Peter and Dumia to just give us a bit of a recap. Okay, so we're here. We're excited. We're going to be learning. There's more than 100 people. What can we expect? Why is this important? And how did Corporate Bank come up with this idea and how is it going so far? Um, over to you, Peter. Hi, hi, Sam. Confirm that you can hear me and you can see me? Yes, very well. All right. Uh, great. Me, I couldn't see you, but I think um, I'm, I'm glad that you are here together with us and uh, many thanks to our participants for the day, our customers is yet another day that uh, mm. God has given us to meet again online and learn. And I think uh, so far, uh, uh, we must say that um, the last two or three engagements that you've had in this series, we must uh, acknowledge that you really been able to benefit. And I can see a number of our customers say that uh, we've been able to learn something. Uh, I think the last session, you had a very good uh, session. So thank you so much, uh, Sam, and I think thank you so much, um, uh, Mwakisha, for the great prayer and so far. Uh, just to give us a bit of background on why we are here is just to say that um, it is an opportunity that uh, uh, Cobank 
have uh, you know, uh, so far to, to say that we continue to engage our customers, our MSMEs, all our entrepreneurs, uh, just to make sure that uh, we keep ourselves learning. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to keep uh, networking amongst ourselves. And I can see a number of us sharing our details, our contacts. Um, I think this is the third series of our webinars. Remember in the last three years, we've been doing online sessions and, and a bit of uh, physical engagements. And I think today we have added that topic uh, coming from uh, the team uh, from AMI. And that, uh, that got some insights uh, from Mwangula on personal and business finance and how to win on both. And uh, of course, uh, Daniel Karaimo from uh, CoBank also came in and talked about a bit of um, digital solutions that we have uh, and the products that we give to our customers to support them on the operational efficiency uh, for them to be able to make payments. Um, as it indicated, uh, it's, a, it's a program at our business banking department where we, um, we keep a learning uh, and so far, we, as I indicated last, last week, we've done more than uh, 80 sessions where we've been able to impact over, uh, over 6,000 of our business customers out there. Uh, and I think uh, from where we sit, we can say that uh, it has been very helpful and impactful to us as we continue to do our businesses. You also notice that uh, we've had some uh, physical engagements across the network where we've been able to meet all of us, a number of us, um, to our different locations as we do business. And we had some very networking, very uh, nice and very good, very impactful uh, physical forums. We will continue to do this uh, through our MSME clinics and through our MSME networking forums that will also be uh, coming through uh, uh, as we proceed with the year. So uh, we indicated that we will continue to support our business customers on our financial solutions and the non-financial solutions just to make sure that we are enabled to do this business. So uh, in this program, we'll have 12 month sessions. This is that. So we still have other 47 or so uh, some uh, sessions that we learn together. So our customers, we continue to encourage us to be on the lookout and stay tuned for all these upcoming uh, webinars. Um, so, so today we'll be talking about uh, accounting essentials and strategies for businesses and also share a few insights around our loan requirements. So uh, ours as CoBank is to really welcome all of us uh, to encourage us to continue to chat, share questions, share feedback so that then we are able uh, to learn. So uh, we'll be coming back um, later to talk about the requirements for loans and I'm, I'm sure uh, we'll be able to address some of the questions that you'll be able to share through the Q&A. Please feel free to continue chatting to us. Uh, we'll continue to engage online. So as Anteni Sana, our customers for joining in good time and Karibu Sana. So I want Very to take good. this uh, meeting back to you, Sam, to proceed with uh, the program. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for this initiative. I know this is the second time round and, and people are definitely benefiting from this, this, uh, this initiative. Thank you, Peter. All right, so, so Peter has spoken a bit about Cooperative Bank and what they stand for, what they're trying to roll out to you and try to help you grow your businesses. Let me tell you a little bit about AMI, uh, which is African Management Institute. So this is a collaboration between Cooperative Bank and African Management Institute, all right? So African Management Institute is all about enabling ambitious businesses like yourselves, entrepreneurs across Africa to thrive, not just to survive, but to thrive. The way we do that is we provide practical, the keyword for us is practical. This is not about discussing theory, it's about discussing practical tools, getting practical tools that we can use and training that is very applicable for our businesses. I'm gonna show you a tiny clip of some of the things that we've been able to do, the number of countries we've been able to reach about 39, about 36 plus people, 1,000 people trained, especially over the last two or so years with the pandemic and so on. But let me just show you some of the stats that we're so proud of. Um, let me go ahead and do that right now. Here we go.
Very good. So that's who we are. And uh, as part of AMI, we have someone who's very special to us. And uh, I'll tell you why we chose Chris Oliver to come as uh, the speaker for the day. He has such, today we are talking about accounting uh, essentials and all to do with our financials, okay? So his role right now is chief financial officer. And he does such a great job in that role. He's been in that role for the last couple of years. And uh, his history also involves working as, uh, um, uh, um, how do I say? So, so in Tanzania, he's had, he had quite a number of years there working with MSMEs. So he brings that experience to this table. So he's not just outside of Africa. He's also very passionate and involved within Africa. He's the chief financial officer. He's been in that role about five to six years, finance director with uh, GM Flow Measurement Services. He's worked in as a business mentor. And I know that that's an area that we are passionate about as well. Some of you are interested in looking to those opportunities to get a mentor. He's worked as a business mentor. He's worked in so many different spaces, including the Institute of Chartered Accounts of Scotland. So ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to speaking about accounts uh, and accounting essentials, and all these things about knowing your numbers before you go for a loan, what do I need to consider? Ladies and gentlemen, there's no better person to have than himself, Chris Oliver. Ladies and gentlemen, please, where you are, if you could kindly just uh, a, a warm applause, or if you could just put it in the chat, type welcome. Yes, 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 please type welcome. Type welcome, type welcome in the chat. I see that emojis are going up. <laughs> Thank you, Winket Njiru. Muka. <laughs> see, Chris is already laughing. Chris, I'm going to add you to the spotlight so everyone can see you. Ladies and gentlemen, if we were in a face-to-face -face interaction, we would all be hearing us making noise. Just to make sure we give you an African welcome. But Chris, if you could go ahead and unmute your mic. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Great, thank you very much, Sam. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm really, I'm delighted to be invited today. It's so nice to speak to some real people. You know, I spend a lot of my time looking at paper and spreadsheets, so uh, this is a real <laughs> treat for me. Um, I also love yeah. uh, working with SMEs. You're the world's optimists, and it's great working with optimists. So I'm hoping uh, yes. we can have a good session today. Yes, yes. So what we're going to do, just to give uh, everyone a bit of a scope of what we're going to do, we're going to take 20 minutes, and Chris has prepared some essentials for us to pick on. He's going to, I'm going to go off a of video. He will deliver in about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. As he speaks, if you get a question or an insight, please put it in the, in the Q&A if you have a question about finances as he shares. If you need him to echo something or just touch a bit on something else, put that question in the Q&A. If you just have a free comment, you can put that in the chat. So um, without any further ado, I'm just gonna go ahead and stop my video and turn it over to uh, Chris. Chris, I'm turning it over to you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Sam. So well, you're happy for me just to start my session? There's, there's no, there's no sort of pre-video to come, is that? Is that right? Ah, okay. So let me, I'm sorry about that. Let me, I, I had forgotten that. So, okay, good, good, good. I see you came with surprises. Good. Okay. So one more thing that we need to do before Chris picks up the session. We have a video that I would like to show you. It's about three minutes. We want you to watch it. And at the end of it, we're going to ask you, so would you lend this person your money? Okay. So we're always talking about, we need more finance. We need to get more uh, financing. We need more funding, things like that. So this is a shark tank approach. Some of you may be familiar with that or Dragon's Den and things like that. So I'm gonna play a video of a lady who's making a pitch and the, all, the, all, the, uh, <clears throat> all the impossible potential investors are at the front asking her questions. I'm sorry, I'd almost forgotten that. Thanks, Chris, for reminding me. All right, here we go. Hello, Dragons. My name's Michelle Turnbull and I'm the founder of the Barking Bakery, manufacturer of poor licking, doggylicious woofins, cakes, and flavored popcorn for dogs. I'm here today to ask a dragon for 75,000 pounds for a 15% share in my company. 
I started the Barking Bakery back in 2012 and I'm now starting to be recognised and supply some of the um, larger pet stores, supermarkets, garden centres across the country. The Barking Bakery is the only business of its type, not only in the UK but also across Europe. Michelle, you probably know that I've been involved in a business. A, yes, a, I do. Yes, yes. In fact, I think we were the first to do doggy you, popcorn. You was, we yes. were. And um, it's a hard industry. Hello, friends. My name's Michelle Turtle uh, in my company. I started the Barking Bakery back in 2012 and I'm now starting to be recognised and supply some of the um, larger pet stores, supermarkets, garden centres across the country. The Barking Bakery is the only business of its type, not only in the UK but also across Europe. Michelle. You probably know that I've been involved in a business. A, yes, a, a, I do. Yes, yes, in fact, I think we were the first to do doggy you, popcorn. You was, we yes. Were. Um, it's a hard industry. We actually ended yeah. up going into food, and that was the kind of thing that really kick-started it because yes. while we sat in the treat end of it it was okay but it never really picked up into this massive volume business so i might as well tell you now it's not a journey i'm going to take again i'm out where do you mainly sell your products well the majority of them are pets at home what are your sales there at the moment at the moment i do in the region of between 40 and 55 thousand a month so what's your last year's sales? Last year's sales was um, 275 was my turnover with a net profit of 195 uh, gross a profit. Gross and a net profit, I'm sorry, of 60 And what are your plans for this year, sales-wise? Year wise? to date is 375 right. with a gross profit of 195 and a net profit of around about 64,000. So why is your gross profit the same as last year when you're planning to grow sales by over 50%? Well, it, it's, it's mainly down to having to um, more staff. But that shouldn't change your gross profit because that's just no. your cost of product versus your selling yeah. price. So I think yeah. maybe there's something wrong there. Oh, 100%. I am not the best financial person in the world. And I apologize sincerely. Um. Michelle, my honest worry is I don't think you're understanding what we're talking about. Obviously, you don't understand the numbers. No. So for me, sitting here as a potential investor, I can only make my decision based on what you're telling me. Okay. And there's a big knot in my stomach saying, I just don't know that I can trust what you're telling me. So I do wish you all the best, but I'm out. Michelle, you said that you sold forty to fifty-five thousand pounds a month to pets at home. Yes. Turnover is verging on half a million a year just with one company. Yes. But then you have only turned over last year two hundred seventy-five thousand, forecasting three seventy-five this year. Yes, because they. Um, maybe I'm not sorry. I'm not very get, making myself no, no, clear no, but, on it. No, no, no. I want to know what's real. Yes. What is the figures you're doing with pets at home? Right now, around about 25,000 a month. But I, I do have all the big companies, you know, I, I sell to Dobbies. And um, how much do you sell to them? Oh, round about maybe 3,000 3, a month. Yeah, and who Ocado, else? Cardo. How much do you do with them? Probably the same, 3,000 a month. Okay, yeah, who else? Bent's Garden Centres. How much do you do with them? Um, thousand pounds a month. One K, yeah. With those. Um, and then independent little pet stores, eight to ten thousand a month. Yeah, so just on that, that's forty thousand a month current business. Yes. I know you did say you're not very good at maths and business. No. <laughs>
would you invest in this lady's business? So there's a poll on your screen. Um, please give us your response. What is your response to that? Would you take a chance on this lady's business? Okay, so some of you are saying yes. Some of you are saying no. Let's see, let's see. Okay. Does it have potential? Would you, I mean, if, you, if it's your money, the question is, if it's your hard-earned money, would you give it to this lady? Would you give it to this lady to, to invest as an investment in her business? Let's see, let's see, let's see. Just, I'm going to give you just a few more seconds for this. The, the video is a bit longer and we just got the clip out, so I hope you don't mind that. But yeah, the question is, would you invest? Okay. And maybe what you can help me with, so if you've already responded to the, the, the poll, let me know in the chat what your reason is. So type yes and the reason why yes. Type no and the reason why no. Okay. So we'll do that before I, I invite Chris to just help us. Okay. Okay. Brian, Brian says, I think she sounds unsure of her numbers. Okay. Mohammed, Mohammed says yes. Good sales. Okay. Very good. Um, anyone else? I'm going to go ahead and uh, just end the poll here. Let's go ahead and end the poll there. So right now, of all the people who gave their responses, 60% said no. 40% um, said yes. <laughs> That's an interesting uh, start there. So let me just look. I'm going to read some of the comments, and then I invite Chris to weigh in as well. Um, Jacob says no. She's not sure of her numbers. Uh, Adika says she spends much on staff, ignoring the important parts of the business. Very good. Uh, Junior Fred says, yes, I can help her in marketing because she's not good at marketing. Okay. Junior Fred specifically wants to help with marketing. But the question is, would you, in, as an investor, if you were the investor, that's the real question, would you give her your money to invest? Elizabeth says, no, she has very good product. However, she's not clear on her numbers. Okay, I'll just read two or three more. Wallace says, I think it's a mistake to go to Dragon's Den without a solid foundation of financials. Fair enough. Maybe she's not good with presentation. Okay. No, untrue of her numbers. Uh, she lacks, what she lacks is financial literacy. Thank you, Samuel. Okay. And then David in capital letters says, no, she is not good at sales. Okay, good. So keep those coming. But uh, I know Chris is looking at those as well. Chris, I'd like you to, in, to come in. Give us what's your comment? What's your comment on this video and the responses that you've seen? 40% of the people would uh, invest, 60 won't, and the comments that you've seen. What's, what are your thoughts right now, Chris? Yeah, thanks, Sam. This is very interesting, isn't it? It's a very interesting video, too. I mean, I felt so embarrassed for the woman, really. We're probably all feeling what a horrible situation to be in. But yeah. uh, I mean, it does sound like there is a business there, but she certainly needs help. So, um, it's a question of whether you think you could work with her. Is that somebody who is uh, manageable as a business person and with you as an investor? I think she might have something, but uh, she's definitely going to need help. So I yeah. would probably go with the ones who would invest. But that's, I suppose, because as a financial person, I think I could maybe bring some value to her, assuming that she's kind of got the, the, the sales side of the business um, under, under wraps. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. So, so let me let me turn it over to you right now because most of us here are entrepreneurs who we've just, as in Kenya, we've just come out of this election period. The Supreme Court just, thankfully, the the president has been sworn in. Elections have a way they affect our businesses, especially in Africa, whether Kenya or any other country. So that's where we are. We are trying to grow our businesses. We are lo especially looking at uh, the potential of getting a loan facility from the bank or somewhere else. Please talk to us. You have lots of financial experience, especially with SMEs. Please talk to us about these accounting essentials. What, what are your thoughts and, and what lessons do you have for us? I'm going to go ahead and switch off my video now and just leave it with you so we can walk through um, the session together. Great. Th thanks again, Sam. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, this is an interesting time in Kenya. I'm always fascinated about the sort of stop start um, rhythm in, um, in, in African countries when you have elections. I think a lot of it's about knowing uh, 
who you have to curry favor from. So it's the, have to make sure which horse you're going to back and which one's still going to be in the race. So given that that's behind you and it's, this is a new start, I guess uh, some of you will be seeing opportunity and, and that's a great, a great place to start. Um, what I'm going to do for the next 20 minutes is uh, I'm going to try and keep this fairly high level because we've got a very diverse group here. So what I'm going to say is going to be quite general. I'm going to keep it at quite a sort of simple level too, um, just to sort of share some of the some of the key things that I, I look at when I'm looking at businesses and particularly trying to help SMEs. So this is essentially about knowing your numbers and, and how to make the numbers work for you. Um, I th think we have a set of three slides. Is, is there a, a first slide for me? Yes, that's right. So this is the first one. How, when I think about people in business, I can see some people are profitable by accident, but some people become profitable by design. So when you think about it, which, which would you rather be? Do you want to be good or do you want to be just hope to be lucky? Um, so being profitable by design, that's really just about understanding the financial game that you're playing. So you've, you've gone into business, maybe it's for passion, maybe it's for, because of lack of other opportunities, maybe yeah, it's something you've always wanted to do. Um, but you kind of want to be a winner in that game because being in business is all consuming. It takes up all of your time. You really want to make sure that that's financially going to be worthwhile for you. So I guess I have three areas I would drill down to on being profitable by design. The first is just knowing what drives your business. Um, second is knowing about your customers, who are your customers. And thirdly, what is your pricing model? Have you actually thought about how you come up with your selling prices of your goods or your services? So firstly, you know, what drives your business? Are people coming to you because your lowest price, um, service over your competitors? Do you just happen to have a really good location? You're just on that corner of the street that everyone passes by on their way to work when they're thinking about their breakfast. Perhaps you have the best selection of goods or services. Or maybe you've got a own brand. So when people think about cake, they think about your cake. When they think about hire cars, they think about your hire car business. Um, it's just good to, to know, you know what, what are you playing? You're trying to be lowest price, you're trying to be best selection, um, or you just have, have to have a really good location. Um, that then gives you an insight as to you know, why customers come to you, which for me is number two. So what do your customers want from you? Um, and where do they come from? Do you know where your customers come from? Is it just people in your neighborhood? Are they being referred to you by others who've worked with you? Um, perhaps if you're offering financial services, do they get references from your bank? Um, do they happen to see you on billboards? Do they see you from advertising? Um, or do they just happen to be passers-by? Is then the question of how do you reach out to more of your customers? We had a, a really interesting um, time during you know, the COVID shutdown, which I must have been scary for, for all of you who are in business. The, everything we thought we knew was just turned upside down, wasn't it? Um, we, had to, we were able to reach out to a lot of customers um, at, like yourselves because of our online platform. And I remember one in particular, a, a chicken farmer who's actually is based in uh, Nigeria, who gave us some feedback later, who said really connecting with AMI at that time pretty much saved his business. He was a guy who was breeding chickens and he was selling eggs from his garden gate. But of course, during COVID shutdown, nobody could travel. So all of his customers absolutely disappeared. And he'd never had to think about where his customers were or whether they came from. But he was, he was absolutely terrified as to what he was going to do. He's got chickens laying eggs and nobody buying them. But 
that gave him a big moment to rethink. And um, during COVID, I think he, he went to the towns nearby where his farm was, and he was, he was somehow able to contact customers. And they obviously still needed to eat. They couldn't travel. And he started taking his product to them. And now post COVID, he's actually does his business through WhatsApp groups. All of his customers, he got that personal connection with his customers. And he now advertises what he's got for sale. He's got chickens, he's got eggs, he's got rabbits, he's got other things. And people place orders for him on, on the WhatsApp group. And he's basically become a kind of very well connected with his customers. And he's now, he's now selling based on demand rather than just waiting on people to pass by. So I mean, that's, that's been a great question about understanding his customers, getting that connection, and that gives him great information. So if you know what your customers want, then you can respond to them. Are they buying, in this case, do they like his eggs because they're the cheapest? Do they like them because they're the freshest? Do they like them because they're nearby? Or do they just like this guy because he's a nice farmer? The other piece to this is about pricing. I mean, pricing's a big question, isn't it, for all business people? It's, you kind of want to win work. Customers have got money and you want it. The, the temptation is to go in lowest price, under, undercut your competitors, but that might make yourself un, unprofitable. Maybe your competitors know something that you don't, that your, your costs of running, of doing your business uh, mean you have to put your prices at a certain level. So I wonder if you've thought, how do you set your selling prices? Do you know what your costs are? And then you add a certain amount to your costs. They can multiply by two or by three. Or do you just look around and, and do some guesswork when you see what others are charging for the same thing? Have you got any ability to set the price? Or are you always going to be pegged down to what your competitors are doing? Um, the other piece on pricing then is to know, you know which are your most profitable products. Maybe there's some products and some services you can charge more for, and that will cover the ones that are um, where, where you believe much tighter and you've got much more competition. Um, and that will lead you to think about knowing which ones are the most profitable. So it's on this first part. So trying, you know, trying to be profitable by design is it's about knowing your costs and then pricing for profit. So make sure your selling price is above your costs or else you're really in a loser's game from the very start. And then you know, knowing how much profit you make from each sale, you can then work out how many, what quantities you need to be selling each week and each month to cover all of your costs which we're gonna look at on the next slide. And then the other side is to manage your costs, to make sure your costs don't run away from you. Um, now, this is all very easy for me to say, but of course you need to have good accounting records to be able to work this kind of thing out. Um, and we're not gonna go into that today, but AMI do have good uh, material on bookkeeping and so on. But um, it's really about understanding in the business that you're in, making sure you're in, you, you can make profit. And if your business is well properly priced, you've got a good understanding. I mean, that's like a cow that's going to continue to give you milk for years to come. So it's, it's a really good sort of um, starting point is setting out to be profitable by design. Okay. So that's the first part. Um, I'll go into the second part and then we can maybe think about some questions after that. The other piece I have in mind is what I call the golden triangle. Um, and if you, if you saw the, the woman on that video there, wow, she got herself in a bit of a mess, didn't she? Between what's gross profit, what's net profit. She's got all the, what's her revenue. She's got all these financial people throwing these questions at her and it's not her expertise. Um, I don't know how many of you feel comfortable with your numbers, but I don't suppose you went into business to become accountants, but you, you are expected to be knowledgeable about that kind of thing, particularly if you're approaching a bank. Um, 
for a loan. So these three, these three topics. The first one is revenue. So this is about just knowing your business. Can you tell the story of your business? What, what are your weekly sales and your monthly sales? Um, oh, I see someone's raised their hand. No. Um, yeah, the revenue is just about, about knowing how much you sell in a week. So do you have targets? And do you monitor how well you're doing against your targets? For me, that's an important thing. You know, if you have a plan, then you can know if you're doing well against plan. If you don't have a plan, you're really just leaving your business to chance. Um, do you expect your revenue to vary through the month? Is there, is there times when you're liable to be busy? Is there time, times when you're liable to be quiet? You know, is your business seasonal? If so, you can, you can plan for that. Um, do you, do you keep records of your revenue? It's worth doing that. Just have a look to say, why is this week different from last week? Why is, why is Tuesday last week different from Tuesday this week? Um, that, that's a really good early warning sign. You know, is your business growing or is your business declining? Um, what's happening on days when it's high or on days when it's low? Maybe you've got some staff who are particularly good at selling. Maybe you've got others who aren't. Um, the other thing about revenue is, are you selling for cash or are you selling on credit? So do people pay you with shillings or pay you by M-Pesa so you get the money immediately? Or, or, or are, you, are customers coming to you because you give them credit? When credit's great for your customers, it might not be great for you because you need to know who owes you and you need to chase them up. That can be very time consuming. And if you have customers who are slow payers, that can really harm your business. So you need to have good records about that. Great to be in a cash business, but if you're certainly if you're dealing business to business, you might have to give credit to your customers. And then that's something you really have to focus on. That's an important part. Um, also, when analyzing your revenue, if you've got good records, you can see you know, which are your best selling services and your best selling products. That's what you should be focusing on. Um, it might also tell you who your best customers are. You know, do, are there some people who come all the time or all your customers just come once and, and then they're gone? Um, are your, are your so-called best customers buying your most profitable products? Because that's, like that's like a great scenario. How do you encourage them to buy the products that, and services that you make money on? But the main piece for me on revenue is just looking at the trend. If you look week on week, month on month, is your business growing? Okay, so that's the revenue. If you think back to the film, the woman had a lot of knowledge about her revenue, actually. She knew which customers were buying what, so she could talk quite well about that. So I was quite comfortable. She had quite a strong focus on, on her revenue. Did she have revenue targets? I don't know that that would have been interesting to know. The second part of the golden triangle is this thing called gross profit. Um, can anyone give me a, a definition of gross profit? Maybe just put that in the in the chat before I, I tell you. I know we've got some, I've got some, we've got some, lots of smart people in this group. So has anyone got a nice simple definition of gross profit? No, okay, I'll not put you on the spot. Um, oh, what, what gross profit is? No, it's not profit before tax. This is good. I, I like uh, this. This is this, this is fine. No, okay. <laughs> this is good. So, so gross gross profit. It, it's your first measure, actually. It's if you're in a trading business, gross profit is very easily easily. Let, let's say you're um, you've got a little. Um, a little duka, so you're, you're buying products that you're selling on. So maybe you buy bread from a baker and you sell it on to your customers. So the gross profit is simply the distance, difference between what you buy at and what you sell at. For example, 
you know, you might buy bread at 25 shillings a loaf and you might sell it at 50 shillings a loaf. That, that's, your, that's your plan. So you know that for every loaf that you sell, you're making 25 shillings. Okay. And tells you that um, your gross profit percentage is 50% because if you, if you sell your loaf for 50 shillings, you bought it for 25 shillings, you've made a gross profit of 25 shillings, and that's 50% of your revenue. So it's telling you that every shillings into your business is giving you a gross profit of 50%, okay? So 100, 100 shillings gives you 50 shillings gross profit. Yes, thanks, Sam. It's revenue minus cost of goods. Um, now that's a really interesting measure because if you're if you're planning your selling prices, when you look at your records at the end of a day or end of a month, you should see that your gross profit is fifty percent of your revenue because that's what you planned to achieve. Now, if it's not, what's happening? Are you are you on, are you selling at the wrong price? Or are you buying at a different price than you expected? Or maybe some sales aren't being recorded. Is something happening with your stock? You know, I mean, if there's, there's perhaps there's some shoplifting going on or something. So you know, some of your some, some of your stock is going and you're not seeing it in terms of revenue. That's um, that's a really interesting trend, actually. That's whether the the, the gross profit percentage is what you expected. Um, you might also have different gross profits for different products because you know you can, for bread, you can double the price on what you buy. Maybe for milk, you can triple the price for what you buy. Maybe for apples, it's going to be less. But if you look at your gross profit overall, it lets you see how the different change in your sales mix is affecting what money you've got for gross profit. Um, we can go into more detail on this, but just trying to keep this quite high level. So gross profit is your revenue less your less your cost of goods or your cost of services. So if you're, if you're buying something in, um, you'll make a gross profit. It's from the revenue that you get. You've got what is left to pay for all your other costs. And this is where you come to net profit. So net profit is calculated when you take your gross profit and then you deduct all the other costs you have to pay. So paying your staff salaries, maybe paying your rent, paying your utilities, they all have to be paid for from gross profit. And that gives you your net profit, which I think is what most of you would define in beforehand, so your net profit before tax. Um, so the, these costs that come off gross profit, it's, it's what you often call they're often called overheads. So what are overheads? That's the sort of heavy weight that kind of lays de uh, weighs down on you. If you're paying rent, you're paying staff, you know, these are costs you're going to have to pay whether or not you sell anything at all. So this is the kind of burden that's, that's pressing you down. These are your overheads. Um, but it's interesting in, in calculating that, let's say your sales in a in a week are um, well, let's say your overheads are fifty thousand shillings a week. That's what you pay your staff. It's what you pay for rent. Fifty thousand shillings a week. Now you want to make a profit of ten thousand shillings a week. So in order for you to make ten thousand shillings a week, if you've got fifty thousand shillings of overheads, you need to be making a gross profit of sixty thousand because that 60,000 is paying 50,000 towards your overheads and then leaving you 10,000 afterwards. Okay, you, you with me on that? The gross profit of 10,000 comes from what's left from your gross profit after you've deducted your overheads. So to make 10,000 profit in a week, we need to have a gross profit of 60,000. Now, if our gross profit just comes from selling bread, to use that previous example, we said that bread has got a, our bread has got a 50% gross profit percentage. 
because we buy at 25 shillings and we sell at 50. So we're saying we need to make 60,000 gross profit. So therefore we need to be selling 120,000 shillings of bread in a, in a week. Okay, so now we're getting a, we're now getting a sort of fossil trail back to the top. If we sell 120,000 shillings of bread with a 50,000 gross profit, that gives us 60,000 shillings. We then have to pay 50,000 for overheads and that'll give us the 10,000 net profit that we want. The next step is, okay, 120,000 shillings of revenue. I get that, that's what my target is. But if I'm selling my bread at 50 shillings per loaf, how many loaves of bread do I have to sell to make 120,000 um, shillings of revenue in the week? So 120,000 shillings divided by 50, that's 2,400 loaves of bread is what I need to sell. Which is great to know, that's a really good statistic to know. And it's one you can then share with your staff as well. 2,400 loaves of bread a day. Um, are we open seven days a week? Are we open five days a week? So how many loaves of bread per day do you have to sell? And that's, um, once you've done that calculation, oops. So I've just lost the, um, the presentation. Sorry, I'll put it back shortly. Okay, thank you. I thought it was something I'd done. I hate to be trigger happy like that. So yes, once you you see how we just worked out there from knowing what your overheads are, what your profit target is, what your gross margin percentage is, it tells you what your and your what your weekly revenue target can be. And then when you know what the selling price of your goods are, it tells you how many goods you need to sell in order to make that profit. So again, that's really helpful. That's knowing what do you have to do in order to be profitable. Okay, so some businesses that'll be relevant. It's harder for you you've got service businesses, but it works quite well that as a um, for a trading business. Um, in the middle of that, I don't know if we've got an animation on this slide. I was going to have there we go cash. We've got cash in the middle because cash is king. You'll have heard that um, being mentioned many times. If you've got no cash, you can't be in business because how can you continue to buy product? How can you pay your staff, all the rest of it? Um, now you'd like to think, if, you're, if you've got a business where your revenue is more than your cost, you're gonna have a net profit, you're automatically gonna have cash. But that's not necessarily the case because if you're selling on credit and you've got customers who haven't paid you yet, the profit you think you've made is in their bank account it's not in your bank account. So you're gonna have some cash issues there. So can you afford to give credit to your customers? If so, how much can you afford to give them? If you do give credit, make sure you chase up and collect it. You should never be embarrassed to chase up a debt. Absolutely not. You've provided the service, you've provided the goods. It's your right to be paid. The other side on cash, I mean, cash is the sort of lifeblood of your business. What terms do your suppliers ask you for? You know, if you're buying bread from a baker, do they allow you to pay at the end of the week? By which time you probably sold the bread so you can pay them from your receipts? Or do they ask you to pay up front? So that's putting the burden on you. You've already paid your supplier for stock that you haven't sold yet. And that has a big impact on your business. So just think about what you can negotiate from your supplier. It would be really nice if you could fund your business with your supplier's money. They give you maybe 30 days credit before you pay or seven days credit. And if you can sell that product in the meantime, then that's, that's great. That's helping you finance your business through your supplier. The other area that sucks up cash is stock or, or inventory, if that's your business model. You know, you want, ideally want, people come, if you're running a, a, a shop, people are coming to your shop, because you've got things to sell. So you need to have stock, I get it. But if that stock sits there for six months without being sold and you've paid for it, then that's hard, you know? So you need to, um, you need to um, make sure your stock turns fast. Thank you, Caroline. Yeah, credit, 
supplier makes you pay cash up front. I mean, I think one thing I would say is talk to your suppliers, you know, your suppl- you're, you're your supplier's customer. Businesses need customers. So can mm. they give you credit? You know, just talk to them. Um, yeah. Okay. I think I'm probably running a bit out of time on it because I've seen the third slide. But, so I'll move on to that next one. Um, the only other thing about yeah, cash was, yeah, think about rent as well. Rent can be a big cost, but often you've been asked to pay your rent up front, which can be a real heavy burden. So can you negotiate your rent to pay that weekly or, or monthly or, you know, because that's, that, that's a big burden for you. Right. Okay. So that was, that's the, that's a golden triangle. It's revenue, gross profit, net profit, and in the middle, cash, because cash is king. Right. Okay. Thanks for staying with me. So the final part is a big, the big why. This is a big question. Um, I know that um, Peter and his team are going to talk about their loan product, and that's great. Yes, yeah. Nice to have money. But why do you, why do you want to borrow money? That's the big why. The bank will want to know that. Um, you need to know that yourself. You know why do you need to borrow money? How is that going to help your business? Is that going to allow you to buy more stock? Is it, allow, is it to allow you to buy machinery so you can be more efficient? Or is it simply to pay off a debt? Or is it because you seem to be losing money? I mean, I think banks are unlikely to want to, to back you if, if your business isn't going to give them a decent return. So you need to be very clear on what you're going to the bank for, what your ask is. Mm-hmm. And then I would think, well, why should the bank lend to you of all people? You know, um, they need to know they're going to get their money back. Do they even know who you are? Have you got an existing relationship with them? People like to lend to people who they know. Um, and you know, how are you credit worthy? Have you got experience of repaying loans in the past? That's all going to be information that's of interest to the banks. Um, so when you go to the bank for a loan, you need to be able to tell a good story. Tell them about your business. You're passionate about your business. Get that passion across. Um, you know, maybe tell the story of where you've come from, humble beginnings, hard luck story, mm-hmm. um, racks to riches, person made good. But where are you going? That's that's the next bit. Is this a growing business? Um, and then all these things about how do you make money? So your revenue, tell them about your revenue from the, from the golden triangle. Tell them about your gross profit to show you understand mm-hmm. that you do sell for more than you buy. And then to show them that you understand your net your net profit as well. This makes you sure that you know your business. Um, Because, I mean, you often hear, which is a bit unfair to the banks, but people often say banks are very happy happy to lend money to people who don't need it, okay? Banks are very happy Mm. to lend money to people who don't need it, but they have to be convinced to lend it to people who do need it, okay? (laughs) So you need to be convincing to the banks, but you also need to be convinced yourself as to why you need it. And I think more importantly, you need to be yourself. Tell a good story mm, to, to, to mm. the bank. Uh, tell them why you're the one that needs money. And mm. um, then you can get into, a, I think, a good and an interesting conversation mm. with them. Very good. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you for indulging me. And uh, I'll hand back to you, Sam. Very, very good. Thank you so much, Chris. And, and I want to say thank you so much for those key highlights that you just mentioned. The Golden Triangle. We need to know our revenue. How much are you getting in gross? How much are you, uh, what is your gross when you deduct your cost of goods? And also what's your net when you deduct all the rest of the overheads and the taxes and salaries and things like that. But as you were, so I'd like to ask, um, please put the questions in the chat. If you have a question in the, in the Q and A, if you have a question for Chris, but while Chris is here, maybe I'll ask you just one question. So as you went about the numbers, um, I'm sure some of us who are really going with you with lots of energy and thrill and doing the math, I, I see some people put it in the chat and the, this divide by this is 100 and whatever. Some of us, I trust that some of us who are wondering, ah, this is getting uncomfortable for me. So is it is it possible? Um, is it possible? Um, and sorry, I should get on video here. Is it possible also that maybe I'm not that good with numbers, like the lady said, how important is it for me to be the one that's good with these numbers? Can't I just, two things, I guess what I'm asking, can't I just hire someone else to do that? 
and how important is it for me to get an education in knowing what these numbers mean revenue gross profit net cash or what does that what is that what would you say to that for those of us who are here and we're in that bracket yeah thanks thanks and that's a that's a great question i mean i always think play to your strengths you know why are you successful in business it might not be because you're a great accountant you might just be a great marketeer or a great salesperson or very good at delivering service that you deliver so i think that's what you focus on um but do you know someone who's good with numbers it could just be your friend might be your partner or you or you, you could go to a professional firm but mm. it's worth getting someone to do these numbers for you and then when you see the value on them i think it's a service worth paying for even if you just need someone to do this you know one day a week or or one day a month for you running Very a good. business on, on on numbers is essential for me i'm absolutely terrified not really knowing where i am financially i might be super busy but then right. I, I could end up just being a busy fool so yeah you don't have to do it yourself but um find someone who who, who likes that kind of thing and then yeah. get real value from them very good well thank you so much and i think if i may add to what uh, chris has just said um while we were researching for this topic one of the things i came across was that question and the, the response was yes you need to get someone who's good at the numbers but at the end of the day they also have to communicate those numbers to you so if you don't understand any of it it's going to be very difficult for you to run a business so at least educate yourself with the numbers and then ask these questions for instance why should i get a loan and make sure you're not getting it to, to place a wrong investment where it shouldn't be All right now let me we're going to go ahead and just watch uh, one more clip that's about two or three minutes long it's of an individual in a different uh contest contest yes it is a contest and let's see how the person did in terms of knowing their numbers we started with the video we'll end with the video and then we'll turn it over to corp to walk us through the next steps as we're here thank you so much chris and we really appreciate you here we go I apologize for that. I realized that Lines, which is eggs from to the if a very aggressive annual growth rate. So we'd like to understand, you know, where you are right now and how you're going to move all the way to 2026 with a 100 million quarter revenue. Okay. Um, our current revenue is at 3.7 million. We have two product lines, which is eggs from the commercial layers and broilers from the broilers that we keep. Um, Currently, we are selling these broilers at live weight, mainly targeting the Soweto market, and sometimes we take to Kasumbalesa. So in the first year, we intend to continue with the same two product lines, but of course, we will have empowered the cooperatives that we'll be working with, who will be breeding their parent stock. So that is why the growth stage in the first year is just at 5 million, which is just uh, for inflationary purposes. Then in the second year, we have increased to 10 million. This is because we are including another product line, which is the village chickens. We're expecting to have at least uh, 75,000 uh, supply, annual supply from uh, the cooperatives that we'll be bringing on board. Um, in the third year, we are expecting to hit uh, at least 34 million. From there, this is because uh, the product supply for the village chickens from the cooperatives is expected to increase in the third year from the 75,000 to at least 300,000 because they would have built enough of their stock. And then in the third year, we are also expecting to increase our production base from the current 5,000 commercial layers to 10,000. And uh, from the current uh, 10,000 uh, annual broilers production to 20,000. Then uh, we're also expecting to bring in the product line because these cooperatives, we are giving them two years to breed the goats. So we're including also the product line for the goats in the third year, where we're expecting them to at least supply us with uh, an annual base of uh, at least even... Uh, 70 goats. Could you give me just a rough sense of some of your operational costs? Okay. Our operational, one. Yeah, our operational cost is mainly um, the, the wage bill. I think the wage bill is the biggest from our operational cost. Then um, we also have uh, the cost of uh, 
cost of sales, which was mostly feed. I think feed is the, the biggest in poultry, about uh, 60 to 70 percent of your cost is feed. So there is the cost of feed, then there is the cost of medication for the animals, then there is the wage bill, then we have uh, uh, depreciation, of course, for the assets and, um, and other miscellaneous expenses that come in. Let me just one small comment. Very impressive. First, let me apologize. Very good. So that was the second clip. Now we want to ask you the same question. How well do you know your numbers? And uh, sorry, no, the question is, would you invest in this particular uh, client? In, in the, if you are the investor, would you be in position? Would you be confident to invest in their business? All right. Please let me know in the chat. So having seen that very short clip as well, let me know, would you invest in this individual? Let me see some responses going. Yes, clarity numbers, Fiona says, sure. Carolyn, yes, I would. He has the numbers on his fingertips. Yes, he does. Quite impressive. I hope you're seeing the difference between the first one and the second one. Very good. I see most of us agree he appears to know his numbers. And I would venture to suggest that so any bank that you go to, CoBank, beginning with CoBank, of course, that is the same confidence that we would expect to see as you come and request for a loan. All right. Now, let me just go ahead and review the top tips that we've just uh, received from Chris. One, the first one, and I'll put these in form of a question. You have to ask yourself a question. Are you making money by accident? Somehow your business is surviving or are you doing it by design? The second is, do you know your cost, your profit, your expenses, your revenue? And we looked at the golden triangle, at least the first three, revenue, net profit, and gross profit. If you don't know what those are, write this down, get some education with that, find someone who does, let's get some education so that we can benefit from that. And lastly, what do you want to spend the borrowed money on? Okay, Why do you want to get the money? If you don't have a good answer for that, it's going to be very difficult to get anyone to trust you with their money. All right, very good. So that marks the end of our session together, but no, not the session, but the section together. But for now, I want to invite Peter Dumia, who will be walking us through the next, perhaps uh, handing over to uh, someone else who will provide us what with what product there is with Corp Bank. Uh, Peter, over to you. Many, many thanks, uh, Sam and uh, Chris. Uh, Chris, you've really taken us through a very, very good uh, uh, presentation uh, on the importance of us understanding the numbers. And I think looking at the two videos uh, as a bank, I would also be very confident in the second uh, gentleman. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, very, yes. Very clear uh, with numbers. And I think uh, even as a bank, it's just to say we are in the business uh, of uh, also supporting our customers and especially on issues regarding. Mm -hmm cash. Uh, and, and Chris also indicated that uh, for businesses to do uh, well and continue to grow, then they can't do away without, uh, you know, with, without cash. And, and I think that's where the bank comes in. Uh, and I think I'll just briefly now take us uh, through a very, very uh, brief session on then what are some of the general uh, requirements uh, for bank for banks to you know, um, support our customers. Uh, what are the requirements that we give to you when we want to finance you? And I think, uh, you know, by just the end of this session, then you'll be able to see and analyze uh, the bank lending considerations with something we call the five C's and the general requirements and some of the things that uh, again support you on e credit. I think, uh, Sam, I want to pause a bit and just ask our customers, and I think having gone through these um, trainings and engagements, and, and Chris has also taken us through some of the things that the banks are looking for, can we chat on, um, on, the, on, on the chat box down there? What, what are those five Cs uh, uh, that bank looks for? What, what is that uh, C that uh, you think bank uh, require you to have so that then we can continue to support you when it comes to access to finance. Yes, I see you, Ruth, credit worthiness. I see you, Chimera, on collateral for sure. Thank you, thank you. 
I see Chris Charity. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> need to find out what is this charity. Thank, thank you, though. You need to come and tell us what is this charity. What mm. other seeds do you think the banks uh, look for? Yeah, cash flow. Thank you so much, uh, Ruth, again. Um, yeah, character here from uh, John McTosh. Thank you so much. I can see we are familiar with some of the things you're looking for. So Lucy, I see you have character. Evans Duda, talking about credibility. Very, very true. Um, I see Ponciano, um, creativity. Um, Junior Fred, credit rating. Uh, cost, CLB. Uh, credibility and cash flows from uh, Jiro Winkit. Uh, capacity, I like this one from Lucy. Yeah, there are, there are several uh, Cs that we're looking for. I see some something about consistency. Um, and I think as, 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 as you can see, a number of our customers and participants are already uh, aware of some of the Cs. And, and you have, I, I'll just take us to be briefly what are the key, uh, items and key uh, C's that we look for uh, when we want to finance you and when we're looking to see how we support you. Uh, so, so I think going forward is to say uh, one of the bank lending consideration, um, you have to take us to the next slide, uh, Sam, is to say, uh, yes, I see something from Lucy here on the conditions. Um, yeah, true, those are some of the things that we're looking for. If you go to the next, uh, so, so it's just to say by the end of this, then you'll be able to analyze what are these five C's, you'll know that the requirements for accessing loans, and you'll be able to determine uh, e-credit facility requirements. Uh, proceeding uh, some to the next slide is to say, these are the, the things that we're really looking for, and we can summarize them in this, and most of us are very correct. Uh, number one, we are looking at the character. I think character is very key to say that uh, even as we come to your business, then we're able to say that we are confident based on the business integrity. Uh, you borrowed with us previously, and you can see that uh, you are actually credit worthy, uh, high ethical issues. Uh, those are some of the things we are looking for. So the good character in you will help the bank to really support you. I think the other C is on the capacity to repay. We're looking at uh, the financials that uh, Chris has really taken us through. Uh, we analyze the figures that you have, the profit, some of the cost, uh, the debt ratio, do you have existing facilities, and, and, and even the need that you have for this uh, money. Uh, the other C that we're looking for is what we call the collateral. Uh, collateral here is what is the bank fallback situation. Uh, the value of the collateral, uh, in most cases, depending with the numbers or the amount that you want to borrow, uh, we are able to say, please provide us with you know, security or you know, something to, to, to guarantee you that should you not be able to pay, then we have some fallback situation. So in some cases, you realize uh, we'll ask you for security, may it be a logbook, may it be large, may it be cash cover, uh, so it's one of the things that we are looking for. Uh, just to highlight, when talking about collateral, we have those uh, unsecured loan facilities that we don't need in security. But of course, we must have scored you to say this is what you've been able to get, what is your limit, and we also support you on that. Again, the other things we look at is on the conditions, how is the economy looking at, um, even currently when we are having a new government, so we also will be looking at the new political forecasts, uh, some of the regulatory conditions, the markets, uh, so globally and locally. So I think well, some of the things that we look at the background is even the sectors that you are in, how are they, and, and what would be the need for you uh, in terms of the solutions that you're looking for. So that then we're looking at the general conditions and, and see how we can support you. I think one of the questions that came, keep on coming again in the last C is then why should you then not support a startup? It's because we are also looking at the capital. The capital here is to say, what is your customer or rather what is your share in this business? So that again, we don't come and, and we invest 100%. We want to see your commitment and the capital that you have even as you come to us for financing. I think proceeding uh, some uh, is to say then um, we have some few general requirements and I know we'll be talking about 
uh, a more detailed uh, you know, uh, training next week on uh, some of the debt management strategies. But we have some general requirements for you to access uh, loan facilities uh, with us as a bank. Uh, we, of course, want to understand you to know your personal details, your KRAP, business profile. We want to understand your business when it started. Um, certificate of registration, just to make sure that then we are financing um, a legal business. Uh, for those who are in companies, limited companies, we require the KRAP certificate of incorporation, the memorandum and articles of acquisition, so that then again we're able to know who are the directors of this business. So depending with a uh, financing amount, we might require to get your audited or your management of accounts uh, and, and, and I think we may look for up to three years. Chris talked about the need to work with someone who has figures at the background, an accountant and, and, and what we normally tell our customers, you don't need to have a full-time accountant. You can have one uh, that will be short-term that you, when you need some finances uh, analysis and uh, you know, some books of accounts, they will be able to support you at a very good uh, fees. And then uh, we also look at the statements. Uh, if you have an account with us, we'll not tell you to come with the statements. We're able to generate it from our end. But if you're banking with another institution, then you will need to provide us with a uh, bank statements, maybe for up to one year. Um, there are things we'll be looking at is uh, in case you have other borrowings, we may need to get you the letter of offer from uh, uh, you know the previous loans and maybe the loan statements just to see how much they need to be able to um, to pay uh, for those who are in partnership we may require partnership deeds uh, and then the other things that we also give uh, you is the loan uh, application form just to make sure that then you feel the need that you have the purpose and even the duration that you're looking for so as I indicated, uh, security, uh, if we are asking for land as a, a security, we may need a copy of your, um, of your title deed, and if you are providing us with your motor vehicle as a security, then we may need your logbook. Uh, the other thing that we provide you it is what we call the signed loan agreement. We have what we give, we give you a um, letter of offer uh, that you execute, and uh, we you know, have that agreement that then you'll be able to uh, to pay as 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 we end. Um, I think those are general uh, uh, requirements that we have as you come to us uh, to borrow. But the first step is to visit us, uh, have a discussion with the relationship manager or the branch manager, and depending with the need that you have, then we're able to guide you further on the needs. Um, or other the requirements or the list that uh, you will provide us with. Going to the next slide, uh, Sam, is to say, uh, and I can see a number of our customers asking about our e-credit facilities um, and, and secured loan facilities. And what we've been able to do is to also go ahead and score you. Uh, you, without you knowing, you're able to have a needing or a score that at the background uh, gives you a limit. Most of you, I know you've been getting an SMS to say you can qualify up, up to 500,000, up to 1 million, up to 800,000. So I think the score that we have is able to determine and give you a limit. And uh, as you can see, we have a limit of up to 1 million uh, that you're able to pay up to six months. Uh, very, very simple criteria and we qualify again as sole proprietors, the partnerships, and also for the limited companies. Um, the criteria here, very easy, because you're able to get these uh, loans uh, through your mobile phones. It's just the cash flows, the credit score that I've talked about, and, and, and I think the other things that um, we've been encouraging our customers is to use the digital platforms to do business, may it be in Copcash, our internet banking, just to support you uh, to make payments and also to receive uh, incomes. And the other good thing about our mobile, mobile loan facilities is that they can land concurrently with other working capital, mortgage, asset finance credit. 
facilities. So uh, the, the game changer here is uh, to ask you to keep uh, banking, pay your loans very well with competition, and uh, ensure that uh, even what you have with us, you are paying very, very well. So I think those are the general highlights around uh, us uh, being able to you know, qualify facilities. And as you have just seen, we've been able to uh, cover the basic lending considerations, our core bank basic borrowing requirements, and our e-credit facility requirements. This is uh, what we wanted to cover, and we'll be having more discussions uh, in, on next week. So over to you, Sam, yeah. maybe for one or two questions that we may need to answer. So the, there's, a, the, I think there was a question for clarification. Does this mean that uh, there are less chances for startups to get credits? Uh, I think someone asked in that chat. What would you say to that, Peter? Okay, thank you, thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, and and I, as I indicated, um, we support all our customers. But I think when you're coming to say that you want some money, say buy stock, we also want to see what is uh, what is your you know your experience in this business. It may not be necessarily long, but we also need to see your capital. What has you uh, been able to invest in this business? If you are in another maybe business or other, have other source of income, we may have a discussion. So, but I think the issue here is we want to understand you more. We want to say that uh, you're coming to get a loan of maybe two hundred thousand to purchase stock. Um, what are your current trading levels so that then we don't uh, overfinance you or underfinance you? Mm. But it's a discussion that we need to have so that then we understand you uh, 360 degrees. Very good, very good. Thank you so much. I think uh, someone else was asking or maybe suggesting, um, I think it was James said uh, SMEs mostly use MPESA as a transaction medium. Would that be used to boost their, I think, statements or something like that. Let me just read that. Can it be a boost for your bank statements? Can it be an additional to the bank statements? Is that an acceptable? Absolutely, absolutely, Sam. Uh, we, we also pick the MPESA statements in addition to uh, the account statements. But one of the things we encourage you to do is to terminate the monies that you receive through the MPESA to our accounts, it become even easier for you to qualify uh, e-credit okay. uh, facilities. So I think uh, we have, uh, we are able to link your MPESA to your account. That one gives you even a better opportunity for you to qualify more uh, because your okay. account will be uh, very good for you to qualify even at security facilities. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much for that. Um, just maybe one more. I think James, uh, as well as Oppo, is asking the same question. Statements and security, so collateral, are the greatest barrier to SMEs' uh, access to credit. How can you help with this? Um, I don't know if you've really already clarified, but what would you tell James with that? Yeah, the issue around the, the statements, the collateral, yeah. Um, but as I indicated, uh, and that's why we are having this discussion is to say, uh, some of our customers are not able to qualify for facilities. Not that they're not in that capacity, but they are not mm -hmm. positioned to be, uh, to be able to qualify for the facilities. So you have incomes, but maybe the incomes that you have um, is not coming to the bank. You have a lot of cash. Let that cash pass through the account. Uh, mm -hmm. I, and I also already talked about getting a little bit of what to one million unsecured. I think it's not a big bit. Um, it supports most of the customers, especially on uh, those who have the uh, emerging, emerging issues around uh, the needs that they have for their businesses. Very good. Um, Franklin has a quick question here. Can someone use a title deed to get a loan if he or she does not have an account already? So what they, having an account, is that the first step? Maybe just clarify for Mr. Wandera. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I think one of the things we also uh, advise our customers is that we are also not leading to, to security. Because again, we are not looking at a scenario where we want to sell your property. More importantly is maybe to expand your business. So I think 
your business comes first, having an account that is also showing us that uh, you have some business uh, sales or turnovers uh, comes like uh, the first priority. I think uh, the security comes in as a fallback situation. Very good. And I see someone is letting me know that they have a question in the in the Q and A. Maybe let's take let's see Evans. Um, let's see if it's a quick one. How long does it take? My MCOP loan limit dropped. How long does it take to improve? And what should I do to continue enjoying these services? Yeah, I think we keep updating our our e credit on on monthly basis. So every month we run the aging, and and you should be able to should be able to score you uh, depending with uh, the behaviors of your account. So every month we are running the aging. So uh, I think uh, an encouragement to you is to say, keep banking. And again, uh, also have a discussion with your business banker um, to support you just in case the limit, the, the link uh, was discontinued to see how then we take you back to where you belong. Very good. I, Peter, I must admit, I really appreciate how quickly you are answering these questions. Um, Joma has a question. Let's just take two last ones, and then we'll have our call to action and come to an end. Joma asks, can you finance someone working with another financial institution uh, based on his or her salary account statement there, or would they need to be in corp? Okay. Um, we, we have what we call uh salary loans and we also have the business loans so if you're in another institution then we also need to understand um where your source of repayments for these facilities so if you're in another financial institution maybe we need to to see some of the institutions we have uh already have an mou a partnership mm. with them uh, where we have already indicated how then we'll be supporting for business if you have uh, an enterprise that you're running uh, and you're still working with another institution, uh, then uh, we can have that discussion and see how we support your business. Very good. I see in the chat, Evan says, thank you so much for the educative session. And a few others are saying thank you. There are many, many questions. We can't address all of them. Like Peter said, we will have a session. But right now, I want just to connect something Peter said and something Chris said. Banks like to lend people that they know. And the way the bank knows you is when you come to the bank and engage personally with your bank, with your manager, your facility manager, but also when they know your money, when they know a bit about your cash flow, how is that flowing, then that gives them the confidence to lend. So I'm on that note trying to pass over to Peter to give us a call to action, and then we'll bring our session to a close. Peter? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, Sam for, for that uh, uh, session on the q and I can see there are still more questions. We try to answer yes. some of them uh, online. Yes. Um, so I think my uh, advice to us is that uh, let's keep this engagement both online and also through our branches. Uh, we, we have quite a lot of information and I know the next uh, webinar session will be very, very uh, detailed on then how to support you uh, to manage your loans uh, better. So advice is to, again, uh, keep uh, visiting our branches for more information, have a relationship with a business banker who will walk you through and they will come to visit your branch and I mean, uh, to visit your business and be able to even understand what, what will be your financing need. We have those digital solutions that you talked about, make payments and save, very, very key for us uh, to support our uh, financing. We have an MSME online portal. Uh, if you go to our website, there's that link, or you're able to go down and see um, a, a tool called MSME portal. There's Knowledge Hub, and there is a webinar session. There is their webinar uh, tab that you're able to see all the recordings that we also have. Uh, again, as you have seen, we have these webinars every week. Uh, we have uh, how many? For seven remaining, uh, Sam, uh, with yes. you every week. So I think very good discussions that will be coming through, very key uh, speakers will also be inviting, and I'm sure you'll be able to benefit uh, from us. So I think for us, uh, uh, as a bank, we really to appreciate all of you, uh, customers, for taking your time to you know um, learn 
it's, it's critical for us to learn because most mm. of us did not go to school to learn how to do businesses. We started yeah. that I think it's good investment for us to keep learning. Many, many thanks, of, of course, uh, Chris, uh, for the insights, and we hope that you'll be together with us in other upcoming webinar sessions. So Asantene Sana and Sam, Asantene Sana, and of course, the team, the background, Fiona and Naomi, for quite uh, the support. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And again, I'll echo the same. Thank you. Thank you to you, Peter, for organizing this behind the scenes. Thank you, Chris for allowing for us to invite you over for this session. Thank you for sharing very deeply and very profoundly. And thank you, especially you, the entrepreneur who is here. Thank you so much for being here. It means a lot to us because together we are building this economy, not just the Kenyan economy, but the East African economy, the African economy. Where we are is where we are, but the future is bright. We need to move forward and we'd only move one step at a time. And like the African proverb says, if you want to go, Fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, we have to go together. And that's what Cop Bank stands for. That's what AMI stands for. As long as we are learning, we are growing together, we can grow together and, and build everything from where we are upwards. So thank you again. This comes, this brings us to the end of our session. Uh, just some final communication. There's there's uh, if you'd like to contact someone with the uh, Cop Bank, there's the con the contact up here on the screen. If you'd like to contact uh, Fiona on the side of uh, AMI, who is our project coordinator for this particular project, I'm just going to keep this up here for one more, uh, just a few more seconds, so you can get that. But in the meantime, if you if you can give me your insight in the chat, give me. I see lots of people are saying thank you. Yes, we have come to the end of our webinar. Every week we're going to be here. It's uh, an hour and a half, and this signals the end of this particular one. The sessions will be have been recorded and they will be posted on the portal. So you can always go back and uh, just dig in and see what you may have missed. Otherwise, I want to say thank you and very much. Thank you very much. And I'd like to ask, um, let me ask if it's okay to ask, is Ferdinand still here? You started us off with a wonderful prayer and it's, it only makes sense to end with a prayer, Mr. Makisha. Asante sana Sam Kimera. Yes, sir. Very well, let's uh, kindly pray. Thank you, Father, for the successful webinar that uh, has just ended. We thank you for our customers who are supporting our business. Also remember those who are holding public office in various capacities that you will send wisdom, charity, and justice that will steadfast purpose. They may faithfully serve in their offices to promote the well-being of all people. In Jesus' name, we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here, and uh, God bless you. Thank you, Sam.